Hi, I'm Tosin Adeniji, Principal Product Manager at Yahoo Sports and member of Hashtag 21 Whip Content Selection Committee. Welcome to the Blaze Your Trail stage. Before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to thank our sponsors without whom this event would not be possible. We have a panel of incredible leaders for Stay in the Room. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Deepta Madan brings over a decade of experience working in product leadership roles across several privately held startups, as well as public high growth tech companies. She is passionate about building and scaling innovative products and global teams in solving customer problems, driving clarity and demonstrating product spidey sense. Currently, she works as a product manager at Facebook. Charlene Lee heads the product and design organization at Radar a Series B company backed by Accel. Before joining Radar, she spent six years at Google, leading the data infrastructure front end tools team for Google Maps. Saron Counts recently joined the women in product team as the director of programming. Saron has held various positions in chemical and paper industries in manufacturing, market development, market research, and consulting. Most recently, she was the global product manager for digital transfer paper at Nina Inc. And our moderator, Lisa Kostova. Lisa is the founder of the Career Climb Framework and the CEO of a suite of executive development programs for mid-career female professionals in product and related fields. She hosts the Female Tech Exec Podcast and the Free Product VP Challenge which runs quarterly and is open to all women wishing to climb their career mountains. And now I'll head it over to our moderator, Lisa. Hello and welcome to the Stay in the Room panel. I'm Lisa Kostova and I'm joined today by Charlene Lee, Sirone Counts and Deep T. Madan. We are looking forward to an amazing conversation about fear, about scary moments, about sticking to your guns, about following your true path. What is this conversation about? It is about the choice points and decisions that we as women in technology make or often unfortunately avoid making in our careers. It is about staying in the room for sure and being perceived as thought leaders in the room, but it's also about choosing to change the room if we need to. As a mountaineer, I love mountain analogies. And so I always think of it and that's what I, that's how I work with, uh, with my clients who are women in technology as well. We talk about how many of us are stuck climbing a default mountain and how many of us know deep inside that we get to change. Perhaps the mountain we were climbing was a good one up to a point, but maybe it's time to move on. It's time to make a change, to jump off and to leap. So how do we do that leap? How do we get over the fear? How do we work with that scary moment? And how do we get ourselves unstuck even though it may seem impossible. I find that um, from my own experience and um, from the women that I work with in our product executive accelerator, there is a moment in time that happens in our careers. These moments in time are infrequent, but they're very, very important. These are choice points and decision points where we are forced to make a choice, forced to make a decision. Even if we don't make the decision, it is still a decision. So I'd like, us to, I'd like to take all of us back to a moment in time in our careers. And for me, this was, this was a iconic interview with Airbnb um, that I had after I had taken a sabbatical. I had taken a sabbatical. I had started climbing big mountains. I started ma mountaineering. And in my heart, I knew that I wanted to start my own business, that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And yet, who wouldn't say no to an interview with a company like that or a tech company, a tech career that everybody wants you to pursue, perhaps except for yourself? 
And I remember very clearly that moment in the interview where it became clear to me that the things we were talking about were not interesting to me anymore. It was, um, it was a point of realization that left me in complete dread. I saw that that is the only way I knew how to make money. And I did not know any other way to be in the world or to, to, to survive. So that point in time for me was uh, extremely scary. I will remember every single second of it. And I want to turn it to our uh, amazing group of women. And what was that moment for you, um, guys? And let us start with Charlene. Charlene, take us back to that moment where you were the most afraid. Yeah, absolutely. I really love this question because I think we've all had this time where we've really felt stuck. And for me, my story starts with sharing a little bit more about my, my journey at Google, where I've been extremely lucky to have had a career that spanned multiple offices. I started in our headquarters in Mountain View and then moved to Singapore and Shanghai and, and then came back to New York. And each move happened because I was able to find an advocate who both supported me and vouched for my work. And for so long in my career, I'd always linked my success to my managers where I, was, I thrived when I was able to fly under their wing and learn from them and grow. But with my new manager in New York, I suddenly felt so distant and lost with his more aloof style. And it was in this feeling of oblivion that I grabbed onto the notion that a promotion was the signal I needed to show that I was still moving forward and still growing. And so I worked hard, did my launches, shared the impact, and my manager calls me in to go over my promotion packet. And he tells me the work is good, my reviewers are supportive, but he's still not putting me up for promotion. And he starts to explain various reasons around tenure and sustained impact. But everything he said was drowned out by a much louder voice in my own head, the voice that was already blaming myself. And this voice said, <clears throat> I didn't work hard enough, that I should have socialized my work more. And the list went on of all the things that I should have and could have done. And all the second guessing made me start doubting my own work, my value, my experience. And it was in this doubt that I realized promotions are not just a result of how good your work is. It's also a result of how much your manager is willing to vouch for you. And despite what my manager was saying of how he wanted to support me, it was clear that his actions were not going to help me get to where I wanted to go. And so my learning there, as I felt stuck, is you need to go where you are celebrated, not just where you're tolerated. I love this. I love this expression. And truly, um, it, is, it is the places we're celebrated that are most aligned with our vision, is it not, Charlene? And perhaps... I don't want to I don't want to do any spoilers here but perhaps your manager did you a favor in a way by encouraging you to move on to a bigger and better mountain that you are down a little more excited about. No, absolutely. I think you've definitely hit on it is that it was really in this uh this first mountain and the roadblocks that I I met there that really pushed me to rethink what was my reality both in my head versus what was actually happening in real life. Fantastic. Siron, what was the moment for you when you felt the most afraid? Uh, it's interesting that Charlene just talked about feeling celebrated because my very fearful moment came right after I had just been celebrated, right? I was just coming off of um, managing a a huge project where, you know, it had company-wide visibility. It was very successful. Um, and then I was asked to join another product development effort that was ongoing and, and it was ongoing very badly. <laughs> so <laughs> that was, um, I mean, everything that could have been done wrong with this project was done wrong. There was no business case. There was very little or no market research to even discover uh, it made me feel very fearful. It made me feel very much thrown under the bus. Uh, it, it was a scary moment. And I knew that I was faced with a decision that would be risky either way, right? If I said yes, 
um, I could risk the project not being successful and, and being the fall woman, the fall guy, um, that the project wasn't successful. I could risk my own reputation as a product manager. Um, if I said no, you know, I risk being viewed as not taking on challenges or not being a team player. Um, at that decision point, I, I had to make uh, the decision of what I was going to be led by. Was I going to be led by my fear or was I going to be led by my confidence that I, I could put my head down and really do a good job and call on the resources I needed to, to do a great job. And I chose the latter um, and it ended up being a very successful situation for me. So um, my takeaway from that is um, take some time to think about the risk versus the reward and, and really focus on um, of how you can come out of a situation having any kind of learning, whether it's it's a learning that you can take forward of something you want to do again, or a learning that you can take forward of something you never will do again. Yeah, I like the perspective, Saron, of information, just like we do in our product releases and experimentation. It is all feedback. We want feedback. Right. Even something that we would dub a failure can actually be a point of learning something that benefits us that we take away. So I love that perspective. Deep T, would you share what that single moment was for you when you felt the most afraid? Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's amazing to see how some of our stories connect so well even from different walks of life, having not known each other, like it's interesting to have that common thread amongst us. So I actually uh, remember a unique time, a distinct time when I felt uh, all these emotions of being afraid, being stuck, not knowing where to go next. Um, so this was at a time when I joined a few we uh, joined after my maternity leave, I joined back work. And, uh, you know, how the environment around me had changed, how um, things and uh, the team I was working with, first of all, was didn't, didn't exist anymore. There was a massive reorg while I was gone. Uh, my manager was changed. Uh, so this was a new, new manager I was working with who had a little context of my prior work. And uh, just a few weeks in uh, coming back from work, I was told by my manager that um, I'm going to be replaced. And uh, I should be looking for um, a, a, an opportunity with a, with some other team or outside the organization, and uh, you know, move on. So I feel um, that was like nothing less than a shock to me, um, considering I was like on a path to promotion prior to my maternity leave. Like I was a kick-ass PM, leading the entire team, running the entire division. And then coming in and how things really changed and uh, without any feedback. So as you said, Lisa, getting that feedback is so important because I really felt lost, being confused and even embarrassed, you know, and I felt um, being stuck. And uh, at, at some point I was like, OK, well, what am I going to do now from here? I've, I was at that juncture of what, you know, is my PM career coming to an end? So that those kind of feelings. And I also feel, uh, I also remember feeling particularly vulnerable at that time, uh, specifically because I was just joined back from maternity and I was taking care of a few months old baby. So I thought, you know, this is just not the right timing. So um, fast forward, uh, what I did at that at that point, you know, the silver lining in this case was that I knew that my impact here is now going to be limited with all these external variables and the environment that spanned out. Um, so I started uh, looking for another opportunity. The next two months, I really prepared well, started interviewing to as many companies and good job opportunities I could get to. And I landed some really exciting offers at startups and big companies. Um, and then Facebook happened and I, I, I was lucky to get the right team and the role I was looking for at Facebook. So my key message here is, you know, uh, it's all about make sure about you're picking the right environment because your impact is as much as a PM, it's as much about you, but also about the environment around you and about the support you're receiving from the environment. So the last quote here being like the train is moving. So either jump in or jump out, but don't stand in front of it. I love this deep tea because of the visual. The train is moving. Don't stand in front of the train. We've had tra tire tracks in our visuals. We've had trains. We've had rooms. We have had mountains. 
it is it is a serious point though and i really want you guys in the audience to understand this it's not like fear is ever going to go away and it's not like the decisions you guys take are going to be easy and if you deep down know that there's the decision to be taken face it don't stand in front of that train because a decision to not make a decision is still a decision what i find what i find a lot of women in mid career struggle with and again i work with dozens of them in our programs and that is the personalization of the environment. So Deep T uh, echoed some of the themes that Siron and uh, Charlene had talked about, the importance of your manager, the importance of what people's, um, what people's expectations are of you in the company. And you know what, guys, you don't have control over that. You just don't. So what, it is, what is important to uh, do ra rather than... Um, if you're if you find yourself on the default mountain or the wrong mountain or a mountain that doesn't serve you anymore, uh, it, or you're climbing with a non-supportive guide, I've had that experience and it sucks. You know you can reach the summit, but they won't support you. They turn you around, or they make an excuse that oh you're a girl, you can't do a big mountain like this. Um, so rather than change the environment uh, or feel bad because you're not fitting in that environment. What you guys are hearing everybody here say is that you have a choice. You can go climb a different mountain that is going to be a better environment than you. You can choose a different climbing partner, somebody who will truly support you. So there is this empowerment that I see all of you guys embody, um, Charlene and Deep T and uh, Cyrone. There's this power in making a choice and saying, I'm going to choose a different mountain. I'm going to choose a different environment. So I want to transition to my next question here, which is that moment of decision of taking action actually requires support. Support can come in the form of thought processes, resources, frameworks, um, insights that we have. And it often comes in the form of other people, uh, support that we get, mentors, advisors, peers. Um, it is so empowering to see others going through the same struggles, the same challenges, just like penguins on the shelf, you know, when you're looking to jump and it really helps to see other penguins taking that leap as well. Um, you know, which is why I'm such a big fan of group work. Um, that's why I'm so passionate about creating communities of mid-career professional women, because they see that everybody's going through the same thing and they take courage and inspiration from each other. So I'd love to hear from each of you, what are those support resources? What are those frameworks, decision-making tools? What are those frameworks? What are those decision-making tools? What are, and most importantly, what are the people, who are the people who supported you to execute that leap? Um, Let's start with Charlene. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I love how you set this up of going to look for that new mountain. And for me, the way I got through my fear is really by trying to see reality as it is and not just this reality that I painted in my head. And the way I did that uh, was in two ways. First, I recognized my own value and it wasn't until I started interviewing for jobs and hearing other people tell me that they valued what I could bring to the table, that I had launched products internationally, that I had grown and scaled products from zero to over a million users. It wasn't until I heard people tell me that they wanted what I had to offer that I began to recognize my own value and expertise. And this gave me the confidence to start asking for more and for what I deserved. So the first tip is to overcome that fear is learn to see the reality as it is by recognizing your own value and hearing it from others. The second thing I did was connect my past to my present. As I was interviewing, I looked back throughout my career and saw all the different obstacles that I had overcome and remembered how scared I was then, yet I still overcame it to get to where I, I am now. You know, when I left to Singapore, I didn't 
really know anyone. And I didn't know that I would end up staying for three years and make lifelong friends. Or when I decided to take the assignment in Shanghai, I was scared of being in a country where I didn't speak the language and didn't know that I would end up launching an app that would then go viral. So in each of these situations, I was scared, but I was still able to succeed because I turned that fear into fuel. Uh, and it was this fuel to try new things and test my limits. And so after interviewing, uh, I realized that what I needed in order to move forward wasn't a promotion. It was being in a new environment with momentum, as, as Deep Tea was saying. Um, and the environment for me that I wanted was somewhere I could have more responsibility and make a bigger impact, which really meant, um, you know, both ownership on product ideation as well as impact on people. And so after a really great six years at Google, I decided to make that leap and leave big tech to become a startup product leader. And while I really loved my time at Google, I, you know, I really haven't looked back since. Love it. This mountain still fires you up. You're, you know, you're focused, you're climbing. It's, I can totally see it. Um, Siron, what was, uh, what was the support structure for you? And what were some of the resources that you leaned on to execute that jump? Yeah, so I, I have a framework that I, I always seem to go back to, you know, no matter what the situation is. And I, I call it my Kobe Bryant framework because Kobe was, was known as the pivot king. You know, he would be in a game and be trapped. And, you know, the next thing you know, he's out of the trap and he just pivoted without you even seeing what he did. He was so good at it. So my framework is about Kobe, but it is, it is about pivoting. And the way I remember the pivot is that I use it as an acronym and I've given um, some key phrases to each one of the letters in the word pivot. So the P for me is purpose and plan, right? Your purpose is your why. And I think you never wanna lose sight of what your why is so that you can translate that to other people and help them understand that not only do you individually have a purpose and a goal, but you have a team purpose and a goal. Um, and I can't say enough about the uh, importance of planning. Strategize, strategize, strategize. Do not go into any situation without having given it some thought as to how you plan to work your way through it. The I in pivot, investigate, idea eight and innovate, okay? Take some time to really do some research. Don't be afraid to talk to others around you about situations they might've been in where you can uh, use their example of how they were able to come up with some great ideas for how they could get out of a situation. The V and the O go together, I love it. So V, don't be a victim and O, own your position. Own the fact that you made the decision to be in the situation that you're in and, and really make a stance. You know, you don't have to own past failures or past negativity. Um, also, vocalize and over communicate. Yeah. So if you're thrown into a, situ a situation like I was right where you're brought into something that's already failing, don't be afraid to vocalize that there's a new sheriff in town. Right? And you're there to make some changes, you know, over communicate what your plan is. Make sure you're letting the right people know um, that, that you're on the right track now. And finally, the T is my most favorite. Never leave a situation without some key takeaways, right? Whether they are takeaways of things you will do again or takeaways of things you will never do again. And then finally, teach and tell, right? Just as you were in a situation, you probably have peers that were in the same situation. Make sure that you take away some things that you can help to equip your peers and even those who are mentoring with you, mentoring you um, with, with some things that could help them through similar situations. That's beautiful, Sarone. Um, and I love, I love the the emphasis there on service, on giving back, the teach and contribute back, especially not just the people that you officially mentor, but also to your mentors. Um, this is a very important principle that um, I believe contributes to a successful career, being a servant leader 
And thank you for modeling that, Saron, with your uh, with your framework and with your example. Uh, you guys have so much to give, even though you may be junior. And I'm talking about you guys in the audience. You may be junior. You may think, well, what would that person? What would that person? Um, what could I give to to that person? And I've seen examples from my community of uh, mid career product women who have. Uh, just connected a very powerful mentor to somebody else who's been very useful to to them, the right connection at the right time, or the ability to offer perspective and insight or advice. All of these are very valuable. Um, and I also like to piggy that back to what uh, Charlene said earlier about getting feedback from the market about what she had to offer was valuable. And I say, <laughs> I often have clients who come to me and they're like, oh my God, I got this offer or I got funded. I need to learn how to do that. I'm not ready. I'm not prepared. And my advice to, to them is this is market feedback. If somebody is writing you a check or giving you an offer, you're qualified. <laughs> Believe them. <laughs> Believe them. Don't think that they made a mistake unless you totally misrepresented yourself, which I've hardly found any women in our career track to, to ever do. Unless you misrepresented yourself, believe them. This is your, this is your market feedback. So I love that. I love the concept of understanding our value and understanding that what we have to give is much more than what our little minds expect or what we have been looking at in the past. Um, so I love that perspective as well. Deep T, I know that you also have a powerful framework that you use to get yourself unstuck and moving in the new direction. Would you mind sharing that with us? Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's a rather simple framework that I just, you know, over time as I was um, working at different places and figured what I like, what I don't like, I essentially boiled it down to three elements, which I thought mattered the most. So I, call, I also call it the three piece framework. So it was uh, interesting to hear about Saron with the purpose and plan that the three P's are, I have are around um, problem, uh, people and product. So, um, you know, my mantra is that you pick a place where you really enjoy your work. You care about what you're building and the impact you're having. Uh, so coming to that framework, like with number one, with problem, uh, do you like how big or meaningful is the problem you're solving? Like, do you feel excited about that problem you're solving as a PM? Um, you know, do you relate to that? So that's number one. I, I constantly go back and reassess at any job of mine is what what am I what is the problem I'm solving for? Who, who am I solving for? How big is it? So so that thing. Number two is people. So can't stress enough how important it is to be around the right people and, you know, make sure you're in that right supportive environment where you can grow. So do you enjoy working with the people you work closely with? Uh, have you established a circle of trust with, with the people you work with? Um, and number three is the product. So as a product manager, you will you are responsible for your product, but uh, do you even relate to the product you're building and the impact you're having? So um, I feel this framework has served me well, like I, to reassess, to know when it's time to move on or, or continue. If I'm continuing to be excited about these three things, I'll continue, you know, driving forward with, with my existing company. Um, I think one last point to make here is make sure that you're leaning uh, your ladder against the right wall. Because if you're not leaning the ladder against the right wall, any step you make will still land you in the wrong place. So that's just a way of looking at it. <laughs> I think uh, I think Deep T, you take the price for uh, for visual analogies. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> we have the train. We have the ladder. Hopefully, you're not le leaning the ladder against the uh, train. I think that would be no, very no, no. risky. <laughs> <laughs> don't lean your ladder. <laughs> don't lean you lean your ladder against the moving train, please. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and yet, uh, I. I love this because all of you guys are, are are distilling your own frameworks, your own tools, your own resources. You you guys are learning, and you 
uh, have come up with these frameworks and I have one of my own and it's very simple. Of course, it's called CLIMB. <laughs> uh, and uh, C stands for cut the noise. Uh, L stands for lead, don't be liked. Um, I stands for internal customers, serve them. M stands for master your craft. And B is my favorite, just like Deep T, it's the people. Be mentor, then become a mentor. So I want you guys, those who, uh, who are listening, I want you guys to really understand that nobody out there has the right answer. Do you guys see how every single woman here has distilled her own lessons, her own framework of looking at the world, her own recipe for decision making, her own recipe for prioritizing? As you guys go on in your careers, you're going to need to make decisions uh, much more frequently and the consequences of those decisions are going to be bigger and bigger. So having these tools and frameworks that Charlene and Deepti and Saron shared is very, very uh, valuable. It is very important and personalize them to yourself. What has worked for you? Um, what has supported you in the past? And one thing I'd like to also point out, notice how the common thread here is people. Like we are not lone climbers. We're not lone climbers. We can never do anything that we can by ourselves. Gone are the days of the lone wolf, you know, back in the day where you could just sit in a corner and do something by yourself. Not only can you not develop products or be effective? But the more you rise in your career, the more your ability to work with, with people, be supported and support in turn, pay that mentorship forward is going to be invaluable. That is the different skill that you guys need to climb high altitude versus to climb the lower parts of, of the mountain. So I... Um, you know, um, I want to start wrapping this up by looking at looking at your younger selves back when you were stuck in that scary place. Hindsight is twenty twenty, and um, you know, reality is that we can always say, oh, "I should have done this. I should have done that. I could have done this." Um, but it is um, it is important to understand what we've learned. And it's important to also inspire others with the, our courage and what we are taking away and our own experience. So if I could talk to my younger self, what I would say is I would say, Lisa, you know that, the, that this big mountain is the one you want to climb. This one over here, it's, it's done its job. Like it's not exciting for you. Even if you try your best to stay here and do what you think others expect of you uh, to, to uh, do, you're not going to be happy. You're going to grow resentful. You're going to grow. You're going to burn out. You're not going to find meaning in your life. So go for it and trust that when you're clear, your intentions that you're transmitting are clear and the universe delivers opportunities, doors open, everybody around you knows what you're about now. And so things start falling in place and connecting much faster and much better than you have ever expected. So what would you guys say to your youngest selves? Let's start with you, Charlene. Yeah, absolutely. The thing I would tell myself, I think, would be to be comfortable with the uncomfortable because your first step, your first job, venture, or even first so-called failure in the new world may not be what you want, but it may be a key piece that'll take you where you need to go. And for me, missing out on that promotion was the key piece that I needed to see my own value and take the leap to leave Google and transition to a startup. And also take on the challenge to not just be the first technical female leader at the company, but to be the first technical female employee, period. And to have trailbla trailblazed that path for more women to join and to shape the team's product and edge culture has brought me immense joy and fulfillment in a way that I never could have imagined. So I would encourage everyone in the audience to be comfortable with the uncomfortable because that discomfort may be just the necessary force to move you forward and to push you to go climb that, that next mountain. Yeah, fear is necessary. Fear is good. When we move past our comfort zone, we need to feel anxious. Um, I had a client of mine who just got funding to uh, do her own incubator. 
And she said, Lisa, I have so much fear right now. And I said, that's amazing. That's amazing. That's great news. It means what you're doing is putting you out of your comfort zone. And it's important because when we're going for the summit, summit days are full of anxiety. They're full of that kind of alertness that keeps you focused and keeps you paying attention. So fear is great. It means you're out of your comfort zone. Go you, Charlene. <laughs> Love it. What about you, Saron? What would you tell your younger self? Yeah, I would tell my younger self, don't forget to be your own biggest cheerleader. Because if you can't sell it to yourself, then you probably can't sell it to anyone else. Right? You can look at no matter what situation you might be in. I'm sure you can point to past situations where you've been successful, where you had hard decisions to make, where you felt fearful and you felt like you couldn't get through it and you got through it. So take those to to give yourself the confidence to say, you know, yeah, I, I might be down, but I can pick myself up and I can keep moving forward. So be your own biggest cheerleader. So, so, so important. And have a cheerleader around you who believes in you too, because at times, at least I have found uh, that my inner cheerleader fails. <laughs> and then I need, <laughs> I need, I need an external one to help prop up that one. But yes, yes. And the internal cheerleader gets ever more confident, the more we surround ourselves with people who believe in us. Isn't that so Charlene? Yeah, oh, absolutely. absolutely. And Charlene. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And deep tea. So deep tea, what about, about you? Yeah. So talking about that and somebody who really believes in you, like obviously you want to believe in yourself, but you need also an external person believing in you. So one thing I wish I'd known early in my career was that it's so important to pick your manager. You know, when I was uh, younger in my career, I cared about the job. I picked a job and I would worry about the task I'm, I'm supposed to be doing there. And as long as I felt confident with that, I would go with it. it. It didn't matter who my manager was. But I feel over the years, I've realized that it is so important to align yourself with someone who really cares about you, about your personal development, who aligns with your objectives, wants to see you succeed and get to the next step. Um, so I feel, yeah, getting getting that right manager and then somebody who can even, um, you know, assess if, if this you at some point you're going to outgrow this role and want to move on to something else. And they also support you in moving to that next step of your journey. So um, I, that would be one advice um, that I would give to my younger self. Like I wish I had picked the right manager to work with along with the team and, you know, the job at hand. But see... One could also say that if you hadn't learned from those mistakes, A, you could have still been doing what you what you were doing earlier on. You could still have cared more about the job than the manager, but you were self-aware enough and you took a lesson and you codified it in the decision-making framework that now is very important to you. The P in your framework stands for people, right? Um, one of the P's. So oftentimes it is just as important to capitalize on our quote unquote mistakes or what we learned as it is to kind of get another chance, right? Can we actually react in a different way when we get another opportunity to choose or another decision point? What can we learn and how can we actually be, uh, have a better outcome next time around? So Deep T, um, what are some words of encouragement that you would offer your younger self? I want to, I want to get you to be encouraging and uh, and inspirational to to your younger self. What else would you tell her? Yeah, I would um, definitely say be bold and fearless. Like there have been times I have not taken the next leap or the next opportunity thinking maybe I'm not ready for it or maybe there are better people, you know, people who are more qualified or better equipped to to take on that role. And I feel uh, right anytime I've taken that risk, it has resulted in multiplicative of rewards as Charlene was saying. So yeah, definitely I would do more of those bold moves and uh, go outside of my comfort zone to really expand on what I can offer and uh, grow as a PM and a person. <laughs> yes, yes. And a PM and a person, um, 
we I see a lot of women in uh, in technology compartmentalizing our lives and our careers, and I have definitely been there myself. I used to kind of have my work hat, and then I would go and have my kind of hobby hat. I would have my like sports hat. I would have my family hat. But what you just said, deep is so important because ultimately we make a decision for our life. We don't make a decision just like for this compartment of my career versus that. And the relationship with the manager that you discussed earlier, having a manager, it, it really, I, I, unfortunately, I do believe that bad, bad managers result from bad managers. And it is so important to understand when you have a, a good manager and to learn from a good manager, even if you don't have one, find one somewhere, find a mentor, learn what makes a good manager so you can be a good manager, so you can break that cycle. Because it's really, really rare for a manager to be care enough, care more about the relationship than the immediate benefits that an employee can provide the company, right? But those are the managers who build long-term relationships that transcend company lines. Those are the relationships that you can take away. And that manager has been very smart and um, has been a great role model for you, Deepti, because uh, they understand that your guys' relationship is not going to end with that company, you're going to be in a position to connect and pay that forward or or be of service to them or somebody else that they're working with. Um, so that is super important for all of you guys to kind of understand. When you're talking about pe people and managers, it is really um, a long-term game. It's really a long-term game. And that's why all of these women here are saying how important it is to align with the right, uh, with the right person, the right, the right people. So this this has been an amazing conversation. I have personally learned a lot from, from you guys and I want to acknowledge you and I want to honor the courage that you guys have shown in your careers for being in scary places, taking the difficult decision, the difficult choice, being trailblazers. I honestly believe that the world needs more women product leaders and that you guys are operating right now with few of few role models. Um, but it is through your example. It is through your experience and the resources that you've collected and that you've shared so generously with our audience that you will model uh, what is possible for everybody who's watching uh, and who's listening. So I would in love, I would love to keep in touch with our audience. And if you're in the audience, feel free um, to connect with Deep D and Sirone through their LinkedIn profiles. Uh, Charlene has an amazing new blog that she's starting. So definitely go and check it out. It's uh, charlenelee.me. So charlenelee.me. And um, I have my free product VP challenge coming up just after the Women in Product Conference. So feel free to follow me there and check it out at uh, www.productvpchallenge.com. Uh, and it's a totally free experience. I would love to see you there and connect with you. Thank you so much. Um, any last words from from you guys, you've been so fantastic and I'm so honored to have had this conversation with you. I would say thank, thank you, you, Lisa. Yeah. yeah thank, thank you, Lisa. Lisa. Oh, this was great. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, Deepti, Charlene, Siron, and to all those who have joined us today. Did you enjoy this as much as I did? Connect with our panelists in our follow-up interactive sessions later today. Check the agenda for more details and coming up tomorrow on this stage, hone your vision and find your vertical.